All right, well, good morning. It's good to be here, and welcome to everyone joining us online, watching this, either live or recorded, uh, our students and alumni. It's good to have, good to have all of us together as a seminary community. Um, I faced a really challenging decision, really confusing time in my life recently. I was in Walmart on the toilet paper aisle, and trying to, you know, trying to make some of these really consequential decisions that you will experience, especially if you get a mega pack, that you'll experience for probably the next, you know, several months to come. And I'm, I'm there, and I realized, you know, I'm, I'm a guy. I always like to go with the, the cheaper thing typically, but there are some things you don't skimp on, right? It's like you, you may not get the nicest brand of toilet paper, but you don't get the discount brand of toilet paper. And then what I realized as I was on the toilet paper aisle is that, that it's hard to compare. It's not apples to oranges. You might have 12 mega packs you know, of toilet paper here, 12 mega rolls versus 16. What's the equivalent and what's the best thing to get? And do you, do you splurge on triple ply or do you, you settle for double ply? You know, it's, it's all those decisions. And I was there. It's just confusing. It took me a while to make a decision. For, for real, I think I was on the toilet paper aisle for 10 minutes, just trying to sift through, figure out, and there's also a lot of options. And finally settled on the one that was the perfect mix of everything, right? Price and comfort and, and enough that I don't have to come back and make this decision again for a while. But it, it got me thinking about decisions we make in life. You know, a lot of times there's variables. A toilet paper aisle, there's, there's a few variables you're looking at, but in life, the variables really aren't as easily quantified. And the options, instead of there being 12 options, there, there are 20, 30, 40, 50, an, in, an infinite number almost of possibilities and of decisions we can make in life. And, you know, as, as, a, as Christians, we want to follow the Spirit's leading in what we decide to do. We want to be led by the Spirit, but sometimes it's hard to know what that is. And a lot of times life becomes really clear 10 years after you've made the decision, uh, whether that was the right decision or the wrong decision to make. And I, I used to think that there'd come a point in life you had to sort out a lot of decisions in your 20s, but then you kind of would get past that and decisions would be made, you'd be settled in life and things would just take care of themselves. But I've realized in the friendships I have now with people up in their 60s and the relationships I have with people beyond that and people in their 40s and 50s and people in their 30s that the, the decisions don't stop. Maybe certain types of decisions stop, right? You set a trajectory with your life, but as you add kids and grandkids and you add job transitions and you add ministry transitions, it's really hard to know. And then on top of that, I know for many of us here and then many people watching online, there are not just personal decisions, but you're making organizational decisions, decisions about churches right now and decisions about what to do and what, what the next step is there. And so you have personal decisions to make and church decisions, organizational decisions, family decisions. How do you really sift through and figure out what the Lord has? And then you look to the Bible and it feels like so often in the Bible, people are making decisions, but it's decisions like the Lord speaks to you out of a burning bush kind of decisions. It's like, who, who, I mean, who else would agree? If the, if the Holy Spirit spoke to you out of a burning bush, you would probably do what the Spirit said to do. Or if Jesus knocked you off your horse, blinded you, and then both spoke to you directly, then, then healed you and spoke through someone else who came to you, you would probably do what the Spirit said to do. It's, if, if we had that kind of obvious leading. One of those examples, and Paul has several of these, you can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, is one of the, the clearest examples of Paul being led by the Holy Spirit of, of, any, of anyone in Scripture, of any time in Scripture. So Acts chapter 16, verse 6, this would be a very familiar passage to us. It says, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's pretty clear. They, they understood somehow the Holy Spirit was forbidding them to speak the word in Asia. In verse 7, when they had come to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. It's pretty clear. So passing by Mycenae, they went to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. It's pretty clear. All right, the Spirit says no. The Spirit says no. A vision says yes, clearly from the Lord, and they go on. And I often, often wish the Lord would speak this clearly to me. I think many of us have had, maybe you're at a point right now, or maybe you're in ministry right now, you're making a decision for your church, and you're trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's the next move? If the Spirit would speak like this, we'd do it, but why isn't the Spirit speaking? But here's, here's something really interesting to understand, is that th there's more going on in Paul's life, right? This is an isolated incident, but there's more going on in the context here, which shows us how to both set ourselves up for God clearly speaking to us like this, but also how to move beyond it and not just wait for a moment like this, but when a moment like this comes, be ready for it and then move out of it. And there's really three big ideas here that I think Paul is living out in his life that helps us know how to experience and steward God speaking to us like this. 
Here's, here's the first thing that I think is so easy to miss out on, is the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul here. But really the Holy Spirit called Paul, right? Go back to Acts chapter 13. The Holy Spirit called and set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that he had for them. And what we can miss sometimes is that the Spirit set them apart for this, but we don't see the Holy Spirit speak to Paul again until this moment. Now, no doubt, as a person who's led by the Spirit, that the Spirit was leading and guiding and convicting him. But we don't have anything recorded in Acts where the Spirit's speaking to him. It's not like Paul's waking up every day and he's, he comes with a new vision of like, hey, here's what we're doing today. Here's what the game plan is. The Spirit spoke to him. And listen to what happened between Acts 13 and Acts 16. Paul and Barnabas go out on a missionary journey and they go all throughout Asia Minor and they travel around. In, in the process, Paul's almost killed. In the process, Paul stands up to a false prophet. He establishes churches. He encourages the brothers. He faces all of the challenges he'll write about later that he, he faces. Many challenges in this process. He comes back and revisits the churches he started. And then he has to go down to Jerusalem and face a false gospel and stand up against the false gospel there. And then he comes back to Antioch. And then he parts ways with Barnabas, his ministry partner. And in the whole process, we're not told a single time the Holy Spirit said to do something or didn't say to do something. Paul is operating out of what he's already been given by God. And here, here's the first really big idea if we want to be led by the Spirit. And that is live to the limit of what God has already told you. Live to the limit what God has already made clear. It's interesting, the people I know who, who want to be in day-to-day -day life and with their ministry the most led by the Spirit of God, and they're, they're constantly waiting until God says something and then they'll do it, are the people, I, in my opinion, are least effective in their life and ministry for Jesus. They're, they're pastoring churches that aren't making disciples because they're waiting on God to tell them to go left or go right and jump up or jump down or sit down. or Like they're waiting for the very specific instruction rather than living at the limit of what God has already said. So Paul sets off on a second missionary journey, which is where we find him right here. And the Holy Spirit, as far as we know, didn't tell him specifically to go on a second missionary journey. He's living out of that original call that the Holy Spirit set him apart to do, to go and take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so he's living at the limit of what God has already said. As a pastor, I've had people come up to me and say, man, I, I just, what, do I, what do I need to do to grow? I just need God to show me what to do to grow. And that's when I'll start asking them a series of questions. Are you reading your Bible daily? Oh, if you are, good. Are you praying daily? Are you not only praying daily and developing intimacy with Jesus, but are you also doing intercessory prayer for others? Are you serving others? Are you actively making disciples and serving in the church and serving outside of the church? Good. Are you doing that? That's great. Are you, are you tithing? 10% of your income, are you giving to the church? Are you going above the tithe and giving to other things as well? Are you fasting regularly? And by the time you get to the end of this list, if someone's looking to grow, chances are there's anywhere from three to all of these things that they're not doing. And so often we, we fail to live at the limit of what God has already made clear to do. And we're saying, God, why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you leading? Why aren't you moving? Well, God, he's, he's set you up for that. John Wesley, in his advice to those made perfect in love, one of his pieces of advice is beware of religious experience without Bible study and constant prayer. I mean, if there's something that speaks to, I think, this current moment for us as Christians, it's, it's that. It's like, beware of seeking experience, seeking guiding, guidance, seeking the Holy Spirit, doing something if you're not in His Word and in relationship with Him through prayer. Beware of religious experience without Bible study and constant prayer. The missionary Jim Elliott said it this way. He said, you don't need a voice if you have a verse. Right? If you have a verse telling you to do something, you don't need God's voice to repeat that. He's already said it in His Word. So this is, this is actually uh, a Bible verse. It's actually, so it's, John, it's a, very, a very Wesley Biblical Seminary testimony of how the Lord led me to plant the church I pastor. But it's a Wesley sermon mixed with a Bible verse. I was reading sermon number 37 on the nature of enthusiasm, where Paul is, is kind of, not Paul, where, Paul, where John Wesley, you know, same thing, where, where John Wesley is taking on um, people who just would say maybe arbitrarily the Holy Spirit said to do this or this is what we should do. And he's kind of challenging some of that. And he says, if, if you want to know what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do, always start with Scripture. And he points to 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And he says, if you want to know God's will for your life, it's always going to be to be holy. That's going to be like the fundamental, like to become holy, to allow the Holy Spirit to transform your heart. So he says, any decision you make, ask these two questions to vet it. What's going to make me most holy? And what's going to allow me to do the most good? And he said, from the foundation of those questions, the Holy Spirit then can guide you right through planting yourself on his word to what you have. Live at the limit of what God has already said. 
And Paul is doing this, and he continues to do this, but what it does is it sets him up when the Spirit speaks specifically to him. He's already in a position, he's already ready that he can extend that even further. That's the first thing we see in Paul's life. Live at the limit of what God has already said. The second thing that we see here in the story is that denial often leads to direction. Right? Denial. The Holy Spirit said twice, don't go here, don't go here. And he's prevented. And we're not told the specifics. We're not told if this is, was a sense maybe Paul and his traveling companions had, a strong sense. Or maybe it was a situation that happened. Maybe they, they were prevented even from like a logistical standpoint of going somewhere. The reality is often the Spirit leads us by stopping and preventing something in our lives. Well, I don't think we embrace that as much because something being prevented or short-circuited or stopped isn't as pleasant. But we have the privilege as the children of God to view our lives from heaven's perspective. Like, I think this is one of the, the great privileges of being a son or a daughter of God is that we're not limited just to, to living in a human reality, living in events in the world and just interpreting those from a human standpoint. We're actually able to begin to step back and try to see with God's vision what's going on. And I think what that means is that any time there's a denial or something's prevented in our lives where there's a, there's a failure even, we can step back and trust that God is working through that, right? Whether he caused it or not, we can step back and say, God is using this. He's preventing something. He's protecting something. And he's going to be leading me somewhere else. And Paul gets, Paul gets two of those denials, but then the denial sets him up for where he needs to go ultimately. What's interesting about where he goes ultimately is Philippi, where he ends up, which is in Macedonia, ends up being one of Paul's most significant ministry partners. Right? He goes there, and it's, it's almost too easy when he finally gets to Philippi, because he, he goes out and encounters Lydia, right? and has this whole church started just by showing up at this place of worship by a river. He gets a whole church plant out of that. He gets his leaders, he gets a place to meet, it just happens. And then he goes and he has this, this demon-possessed servant girl, right, and, and frees her and is able to preach the gospel through that. And then he has the Philippian jailer as well, right? So you have all of this. It's like the ministry just happened easily because God finally set him up. And then the Philippian church becomes a ministry partner of his. They start giving money to support what he does. And he's pretty clear in the book of Philippians that the church in Philippi brings so much joy to his life. Like this, the, these people bring so much joy. And so the no and then the no sets him up for the yes of all that God wants to do. So God, and what's interesting even beyond that, if you want to step back and look at church history, by the gospel intentionally being taken to Europe, and it certainly was present in Europe in some ways before this, but this is the first, it seems like, intentional missionary journey into Europe, because Macedonia would be a, you know, stepping into Europe. By, by this happening, it unleashes what God's going to do for two millennia, even up until now, right? Because of the gospel going to Europe, eventually the, the shift happens from the Middle East area to Europe with the gospel. And then that is where the modern missions comes from, comes from Europe, comes from America. I had a friend back in seminary, Alhamdu, he's a Nigerian pastor. And we were, we were debating in a seminary class about missions and are short-term missions good or not, you know, and should we do this? And, and he pipes up. And he's, he's a big fan. You know, all of us enlightened Americans were like, well, maybe we should do short-term missions. You know, it's not helpful. It's, it's, you know, we don't want to be colonial and going in there. And, and he pipes up and he says, we love it when missionaries, even short-term missionaries come. But he said, in my country, in Nigeria, we look to American missionaries as second only to the original apostles and their impact on the, our, our nation in this world. And we were like, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, maybe, maybe short-term missions should happen, but that's, that's the impact, right, that Europe and then America has had for the gospel. And it starts intentionally through two no's that lead to a yes. So God's denial often leads to direction. So if we're living at the limit of what God has already said, and then we, we're okay taking denials, taking failures, recognizing God can use those and re, reorient us through those towards his will, towards what he wants, then we can be set up for the direction, which is this vision. Now, visions are interesting. I, I don't know. That's not a typical seminary topic of conversation, you know, visions. But it's, it's one of the things that we're told several times in Scripture that is going to mark the era of the Spirit being on all people. It is dreams and visions. I mean, it comes up in Acts chapter 2, quoting from Joel, that, that young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. And we should expect it. We should actually be seeking dreams and visions for our lives. And God's going to speak through them. Now, do we have to be careful? Yes, absolutely. But what we see constantly in the New Testament, starting with the time of Jesus, not even Jesus himself, but dreams around the birth of Jesus, and then extending far forward, is that dreams and visions are consistently used by the Holy Spirit to communicate to God's people. 
Now, what does set New Testament dreams apart from more Old Testament dreams, which are often coming to people who don't have the Spirit of God in their lives, it's coming to kings who are, are pagans, it's coming to people who are trying to follow God but don't really have a clear sense of what he wants, is New Testament dreams and visions always come with an interpretation. So if you look, if they're, if they're coming to a Christian, every single Christian who gets one, so it's not like I just had you know, a weird dream because of the, the two pizzas I ate before I went to bed, and then, and then I'm interpreting some of the craziness. I had a friend text me a, a dream. She, she said, hey, I had a dream about you last night. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. But then the dream went from like interesting to crazy. Uh, it started off with I had an evil twin, and they're trying to figure out who was the good twin, who was the evil twin, which might say something about how I'm viewed by the people around me. And then, and then in the process of it, Chris Evans showed up, Captain America, and then Abraham Lincoln showed up. And I was by the end of it, I was so confused by what the dream was even. I don't even know what the dream, what happened in the dream, but I, I got killed. One of, one of me got killed, and they didn't know which one, and Abraham Lincoln didn't get killed. So I was like, what's going on with that? Anyway, I, it was just, it was a confusing dream, right? Is there any spiritual meaning to it? <clears throat> Highly unlikely. I, had, had, I was at a, a charismatic church a little while back doing a youth conference, and I had a lady come up to me. And she'd been talking to me the, the day before about someone she thought I should date. And so she came up and said, hey, I had a, I had a dream last night. And it was, it was me being in this church, and this, this young lady was there, and the young lady's name was Molly. And so she said, hey, I just had this dream. I think it's God saying you should date Molly. And, and she was saying, like, this girl's talking to you about I said, wait a second, the girl you were talking to me, to me about last night was Rachel. And she got confused. Molly and Rachel were sisters. And she had this dream. And that was like her, that, and what, like the one she had dreamed about was already married, right? For her, it was her subconsciousness, and she, it felt manipulative to me by the end of it. She was trying to get me to have this dream. And, and so I'm, I'm cautious about dreams and visions, right? They can be so manipulative. But what we can't get away from is that we should expect them and seek them, and God wants to speak to us through them. So I want to give you one example of, of a, a weird vision, a weird dream that's grounded and reasonable and good. Ben Carson in his autobiography, Gifted Hands, writes about a time when he was going to med school. I think he was at Yale. And he'd been, he had made it there. It, impossible odds comes from a very challenging home life and challenging situation and from an underprivileged area. And he, he had made it there to Yale, but he was failing first semester. He just couldn't make it. And he was in some of those early classes, the, the weed out classes, and he just, he just wasn't making it. And he felt like he had let God down. He was a strong Christian by this point. Felt like God has raised me up to be a testimony of his grace and his goodness. And I've let God down. So he goes to sleep that night. The test is 8 a.m. the next morning. He goes to sleep that night knowing I failed. I'm going to pack up. After this semester, it's over. I'm sorry, God, I failed you. That night he's asleep. I think it's a chemistry test. And a shadowy figure comes into the room. He's in a classroom and begins to write chemistry problems on the board. And in his dream, he's looking up and he thinks, well... I guess I'm supposed to be a good student here. He starts to write down these chemistry problems. He wakes up the next day, or not, not quite the next day, he wakes up after the dream and writes down a lot of these things. He wakes up the next morning, begins to study them, just looking at them. He walks into the test, and it's the exact test that he had dreamed a shadowy figure had written on the board the night before. Now, what's interesting is Ben Carson writes about this publicly. He has no reason to share about this. In fact, it actually makes him look worse because it makes him seem weird and makes him look like he couldn't do it on his own, which he couldn't. But he, he writes about this, and he, he really credits that. He believes God spoke to him through that dream and gave him a vision. A little bit closer to home, my, my dad, um, his, his mom was getting remarried after 17 years of being a widow. And it was really causing some issues in the family. Uh, it was an old high school sweetheart that came a call in, and it, nothing was going to happen. And then it was, hey, we're getting married in two months. And it just really caused some, caused some issues, you know, just working through it. My dad was just concerned for his mom. He wanted her to be taken care of, and, but just was concerned about what this could mean. And, and he went to sleep. One night, and in, in a dream, the Lord said, this, I, this is how I want to take care of your mom and provide for her until she dies. So he woke up with total peace the next day because the Holy Spirit had said, I've got it. I'm taking care of her. We should seek dreams and visions. So not only should we live at the limit of what God said and, and recognize denial leads to direction, but when God does bring direction, even in ways that we're not expecting or aren't in alignment with what he's done in the past, we should welcome it. And I would go a step further and say we should actively seek it. Part of the spirit-filled life is dreams and visions. The third thing we see here, so you know, they're, they're, they're living at the extent of it, and, is that when Paul is finally told what to do, they go and do it. Now, now here's, here's, and here's what I want us to grab hold of. The spirit never tells us everything. So we have to obey what he does say. That's, that's, the, that's what they do. The Spirit never tells us everything, so we have to obey what he says. Now, it seems pretty clear. He has, this, he has this vision. It's like, well, that's pretty clear. But listen to what happens in the vision. 
The vision is not the Holy Spirit saying you must do this. It says there's a, a man from Macedonia was standing there urging him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Is that the spirit or not? And then, and then th this is what's more interesting to me. All it says is come to Macedonia and help us. There's no specifics around it, right? Macedonia is a country or this time it's a region. It's, it's like, hey, come to, come to Texas and help us. It's like, okay, like that's not very specific, right? That's a, if, if, if I felt the Lord say, hey, go to Texas and plant a church, I wouldn't know where to start. I'm not sure if I'd do it. I'd be like, well, I'm waiting on the specifics. Paul doesn't. And there's a word here. It says that they talk about it. We sought to go on to Macedonia, Luke writes, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The word for concluding in the Greek is sumbibadzo. It's bringing together words soon, which is with, and bino, which is to go. And it has this idea of connecting things together. It's actually used in the epistles of things are held together. It's used of Apollos when it says that he proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. It's, it's this idea of pulling things together using, using the reflection, the insight the Lord has given you. And it seems like the group of them to begin to sift through what's God really saying. So there is a, it's, it's not as clear as it seems like from what they do. There's a process of reflecting and saying, okay, what does this mean? What's the Spirit trying to say to us? And so as much as they know the Spirit says, they do. So it says they go to Macedonia. They go to Neapolis. Why'd they go to Neapolis? Did the Spirit say it? No. Neapolis was the closest port to where they were. So they just took the shortest, the shortest boat ride they could over to Macedonia. And then they get to Macedonia. And they don't stay in Neapolis. They, they take the, the main road, which led to Philippi, which wasn't the capital, I don't think, but it was one of the main cities of Macedonia. They just do the obvious logical thing next. They are using their minds and they're using the sumbibadzo, right? The, the drawing together of these different ideas to obey as much as the Spirit tells them. But the Spirit's goal for our lives is never perfect performance. It's deeper faith, right? So, so we develop deeper faith by taking what we do know and obeying what we do know, even if there's a whole lot we don't know. And so they go forth, and that's how they end up in Philippi, by taking the shortest boat ride and then the biggest road. So it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing deeper magical about it. They just do what the Spirit says. But through this process, then suddenly we come to Philippi, where everything we just talked about takes place. The Spirit unleashes a new level of ministry, new geographical realities for what ministry can look like, new people who are now brothers and sisters in Christ through this, people who are demon-possessed, who are now set free. And it all comes because Paul and the people with him are living at the limit of what God has already said. And then they're, they're taking that denial, but they're recognizing denial often leads to direction. And then finally, they know the Spirit never tells them everything, but what He does say, they're going to do. And they're going to follow it. And the same thing's true for our lives. I, I really hope that in your life, whatever decisions are in front of you, the Spirit speaks clearly through a dream or a vision or through a word of knowledge someone gives you. That's awesome. But you know what, even if he does, there's going to be a lot before that and a lot after that where we've got to walk in faith and trust him. But the Spirit leads people who are actively walking in faith and not sitting around waiting for God to make everything clear. So the challenge for your life and for my life is to, to live at the limit of what God has already said. When denials come, recognize they often lead to direction. And then when the Spirit, recognize the Spirit doesn't tell us everything, but when he does say something, we obey. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for the word which you bring to our lives clearly through scripture and then how you send your spirit to us to lead us and guide us. Lord, and I pray for those who are watching this right now, those who are here in this room, that as we have decisions in front of us, you would help us to be led by your spirit, that we would be responsive and obedient to your spirit, that we would receive clarity as, as we need it, that we would be able to develop a deeper faith as we listen to your voice. Father, I pray especially for those students and alumni who are leading churches, that you would give them wisdom and clarity about their churches, about the directions, about how to be fruitful, how not to remain where they are, but to walk in faith as a church forward. We need your clarity. Lord, we pray for dreams and visions. We pray for obedience. We pray for your fullness at work in our lives. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.